Hi there, I'm Mel Shank, an American architect living in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, since 2005. I have 45 years of experience managing design and construction in the USA and in Asia. And subsequent to that, I have been researching and writing about Vietnamese architecture and publishing books for the past seven years as of 2022. Thank you to architect Nguyen Kien in Vietnam and the International Region of the American Institute of Architects for inviting me to present Vietnamese modernist architecture. This presentation was originally presented live on 15 October, 2021. This presentation and my book, Southern Vietnamese Modernist Architecture, is intended to be a record of the accomplishment of the Southern Vietnamese people as they developed this stunning modernist architecture in the mid 20th century, generally between 1945 and 1975. I wanna thank the photographer Alexander Garrell for the beautiful architectural photography presented in the book, as well as his photographs used in this presentation. Southern Vietnamese architects developed this version of modernist architecture that accommodated the tropical climate and reflected the identity of a newly independent culture. It represented the outlook of the Southern Vietnamese people as they looked towards the future, even in the face of war. I have lived in Vietnam now for many years because I enjoy the high intensity of life here. I love the vibrant colors, patterns, textures, sounds, even the smells, and the incredible tastes in the urban environment that create tremendous energy in the culture. The high density and energy produce complexity in life, and the architecture is a rich part of that experience. Vietnamese modernist architecture captures that energy and complexity and therefore reflects Vietnamese identity. But Vietnam also projects an identity to outsiders. Many tourists that come here are looking for the colonial city of the past. They see the old French colonial buildings, like the one on the right, and they also see the new bland international style towers because they are so big and occupy central locations. But they don't realize that the predominant background architecture is modernist like the building at 91 Dong Khoi Street in Ho Chi Minh City shown on the left. Far over half of the structures downtown and around the city are modernist. Classical buildings call out for themselves with their forms and encrusted ornamentation. I love looking at the 1930 Grand Hotel on the far left in the photo as I walk up Dong Khoi Street I used to walk by the Sea Products building on the right and never really see it. I would pay attention to the ground floor shops, cafes, and restaurants, but not look up. It was only as I did research for my book that I realized that this building is very interesting with its scalloped canopy and beautiful Brie Soleil sun blocking screen above the entry. Once you study this architecture for even a short time, we begin to realize that there are beautiful buildings like this all over the city and that they provide energy to the city through their, their diversity of expression. Modernism came to Saigon with many apartment blocks constructed in the 1930s and 1940s to respond to the constant growth of the city's population. French architects such as Paul Vesser designed many of the Art Deco apartment complexes we still see in the residential areas of the inner city. Vietnamese architects working for French developers designed modernist apartment blocks like 14 Tone Dut Dam Street on the left, constructed in the late 1930s. The population of Saigon exploded after independence in 1954, resulting in construction of modernist apartment buildings like 151 Nam Ki Koenya Street, shown on the right, 
which is very typical of the modernist designs of the Vietnamese architects. The Southern Vietnamese realized they needed to rebuild their economy to foster a consumer economy alongside the extraction economy of the colonies. They invested in their future in the 1950s by building factories and warehouses like this one, designed by Vietnamese architects. That wonderful stair feature supported by one column is a poetic example. This contributed to the culture of independence with an identity of energy focusing with Vietnamese optimism on their future in the industrial age. Meanwhile, the neighborhoods were transformed in the 1950s and 1960s from bamboo and thatched roof houses and two-story French row houses to modernist shop houses and apartment buildings like these along Liduchan Street. The architectural vocabulary of Vietnamese modernist architecture was developed through experimentation on shop houses like this. These compositions express the complexity of Vietnamese life while also being rather restrained, like Vietnamese traditional architecture. The building on the left was constructed as the National Library in 1971 and is now known as the General Science Library on Lidu John Street. It was designed by Bui Quang Han and Win Hu Tien with consulting by Le Van Lam. All major buildings constructed in Saigon after 1945 were modernist by Vietnamese architects with the exception of Art Deco apartment buildings designed by French architects. This design demonstrates that the Vietnamese architects had studied Vietnamese traditional architecture very closely and applied the lessons of Vietnamese identity that they saw in the traditional structures. They didn't copy the traditional designs, but incorporated the lessons learned into their modernist architecture. For example, the traditional structures usually had their roofs raised to allow ventilation. In the library, that is expressed with the floating roof that creates a ventilated air layer for insulation between the hot roof slab and the ceiling of the interior rooms below. The simple and elegant structure is fully expressed as in global modernist architecture, but is complemented by the complex brie soleil or sun blocking screens using Vietnamese traditional patterns in this case. The colors used are earth tones, which were common with the natural materials used in traditional architecture. As in the verandas of traditional buildings, especially traditional houses, the loggia, the ground floor, shields the interior from the hot sun and torrential rain, while allowing shade for socializing around the base of the building. And finally, the design focuses on the appreciation of Vietnamese people of natural phenomena with the ever-changing light patterns in the reading rooms cast by the Brie Soleil screens and the mitigation of the tropical climate with the water moat across the facade that cools the breezes before they traverse the reading rooms inside. There were only 147 Vietnamese architects registered by the Southern government by 1975, and they were all very busy designing the larger buildings as well as villas for rich people. But the growth of the middle class and the economy during the war years created a large need for design of houses, especially shop houses in the urban areas, as well as rural houses like this one. But the people needed to design them themselves they could see their own memories of Vietnamese traditional architecture in the new Vietnamese modernist architecture of the architects. And they could perceive the Vietnamese identity that they wanted to display in their own houses, as well as their own identity. So they borrowed the architectural vocabulary developed by the architects and used these ideas in their own houses. And these designs, in my opinion, were consistently high quality and fit with Vietnamese modernism. This rural house in the Mekong Delta 
was undoubtedly not designed by an architect, but it displays the good design decisions that the people were able to make given this vocabulary of modernism. This photograph was taken by me in 1972, looking up what is now Leyte Ring Street. I arrived here as a US Naval officer in 1971 for a year to manage construction contracts to Vietnamese constructors. I had just graduated from architecture school in America the year before, and I was truly shocked at the extent and quality of modernist architecture here in Saigon. There were many modernist masterpieces in America, but modernist architecture does not predominate in the USA or Europe even now. Along this street, every apartment building was Vietnamese modernist. Along Phan Dinh Street here in 1972, leading from the airport to downtown, 100% of the shop houses were modernist. I felt like I was in architectural heaven. The architecture of Southern Vietnam by that time was overwhelmingly modernist. Clearly, the Southern Vietnamese people had embraced modernism. I was especially surprised to see this overtly modernist monument at the International Roundabout downtown. And I took this photograph in 1972. This monument resulted from a design competition won by architect Nguyen Ki in 1967, and it was completed in 1969. Again, this was evidence that the Vietnamese population had embraced modernism. Modernist monuments were very difficult, if not impossible, to find in America and Europe in those times, and even today. Vietnamese people often say to me that the architecture here is ordinary, and I'm sure it is for them since they have grown up with it. And there are so many modernist buildings that they have become ordinary, even though they are extraordinary in the world. But being ordinary is the definition of vernacular architecture. Vernacular is a word from linguistics that means the local dialect of speaking. In architecture, it means the local way of building. What ordinary people in a cultural region build for their housing. When I came to Vietnam in 1971, this is the vernacular housing that I expected to see. And these bamboo and thatched roof houses were the vernacular architecture of rural areas in Southern Vietnam before 1975. During the war years, cement and fired brick became increasingly available at a low cost. So Vietnamese people began to build more permanent masonry housing. Therefore, the bamboo huts were displaced by the new masonry houses over the 25 years after 1975. So what you see in this photograph is now the vernacular architecture of the past. This is what rural houses along the coast of Southern Vietnam look like today. There are tens of thousands of houses like this from Hue on down through the Mekong Delta. There are a lot of variations in styles, but they usually have a traditional form like this house. However, the plaster treatment is exquisitely modernist, as well as the detailing around the openings and the rain shelf around the building. This is the vernacular rural housing of Southern Vietnam today which is very unusual in the world, simply because it is modernist. And architects didn't design these houses. So how did the Vietnamese people get these ideas? I think that Vietnamese people developed this capability to see good ideas and adapt them for use on their houses. They make good design decisions on their own. This photograph shows contemporary modernist house shop houses demonstrating that there's an increasing use of color in today's Vietnamese urban modernist vernacular architecture. The majority of houses along the streets and lanes of Southern Vietnam are modernist. So the Vietnamese people continue to embrace modernism, unlike most other places in the world. 
There are a few other places in the world with modernist vernacular architecture, including Israel, Brazil, and parts of India. But I think the quality of modernist architecture here in Southern Vietnam exceeds that in other countries where modernism tends to be more functional. Most of the photographs I've been showing here were taken in Ho Chi Minh City. But Vietnamese modernist architecture in the mid 20th century spread throughout Southern Vietnam. This photograph was taken in Mi Tho in the Mekong Delta and displays the same ubiquity of modernist architecture. Southern Vietnam had clearly became a center, not the center, but a center of modernism in the world. But this has remained unrecognized around the world. Vietnamese architecture students often tell me that Japan is the center of modernism in the world. And it is true that Japan has many modernist masters and many modernist masterpieces that have been well published. But the vernacular architecture of Japan, meaning their housing, is not modernist. It is a mixture of traditional and functional features. And the housing is modern, but not modernist. Every country around the world has their share of modernist architects and architecture, but they are just pinpricks in the cultures of those countries, unlike Vietnam. The construction of the new Independence Palace in Saigon in 1966 confirmed that the Vietnamese people had embraced modernism. The original French Governor General's Palace, occupied in 1873, was renamed the Norden Palace in the 1920s. After independence from colonialism in 1954, the new president of the Republic of Vietnam occupied the palace and renamed it as the Independence Palace. However, in a coup attempt against the president in 1962, the palace was bombed and the Northwest Wing was destroyed. The remainder of the building was then demolished and a design competition was held to select a design for the replacement palace. The new building would reuse the foundations of the old French Governor General's Palace and would therefore be the same shape and size. Seven invited schemes were submitted, five of which included rebuilding the old palace as it was in the French colonial neo-baroque style or build in neoclassical style or build in Indochine style, the French fusion of Beaux-Arts classicism with Asian ornamentation. One scheme was Vietnamese traditional. The one modernist scheme designed by architect Ngo Vitu was selected. What would it have said to the world if the newly independent Vietnamese people had decided to rebuild the palace in the architectural style of the former colonial occupier? They made the right decision to build a new modernist masterpiece that truly expresses the identity of the Vietnamese people in the industrial age. It captures the complexity but restraint of Vietnamese life and spirit using Vietnamese traditional forms in a modern way and using Vietnamese ways of mitigating the tropical climate. So how did the Southern Vietnamese architects develop their modernist architecture? This modernist building is the University of Architecture of Ho Chi Minh City, constructed in 1972, when it was then known as the Saigon School of Architecture. It was designed by the architecture student Chung Van Lam as his final project for graduation, with his advisor, Professor Pham Van Tung, who was also the direction, director of the school at that time. This school is the direct successor of a Col Superior de Beaux Arts de Linda Chin in Hanoi, with its architecture department established in 1926. There were students there from both the North and the South, and they all learned a common base in modernism. In addition to Vietnamese traditional architecture, the Indochine style, and Beaux Arts classicism. 
Arthur Cruz from France was the director of the Department of Architecture from 1930 to 1954. He had just graduated from Ecole des Beaux Arts in Paris in 1929. We know that he was a modernist because he designed this modernist building in downtown Saigon. He also designed several modernist buildings in Hanoi. It is likely that Arthur Crewe showed the work of Le Corbusier, the Swiss French architect, to his students. Crewe's arranged for Northern architect Win Cao Luang to work for Le Corbusier and Auguste Perret in Paris for two years after his graduation in 1931 in Hanoi. Crewe's would have also exposed the students to Walter Gropius of the Bauhaus and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe both of which used industrial materials such as rolled steel, stainless steel, and huge slabs of cut polished stone, materials that were not readily available in Vietnam at that time. However, there was and is plenty of cement, sand, and reinforcing bars for concrete, and those were the building materials most often used by the Corbusier. Therefore, his architecture became more of a model for the Vietnamese students. This was confirmed in 1954 with Le Corbusier's new Punjab capital complex in Chandigarh, India, which was widely published. When you look down the long facade of the Secretariat building here, there are at least four different motifs, but the right end probably influenced the development of Vietnamese modernist architecture. The Vietnamese architects could see that this could be easily adapted to the Southern Vietnam context, but they didn't just copy it. They analyzed its principles and then made them Vietnamese. Arthur Cruz also probably showed the students the work of Frank Lloyd Wright from America, including his famous prairie houses. Here they could see the complete break from classical architecture that modernism represented. So this was a way to go beyond colonial architecture. They could see how modernist architecture like this could be easily adapted for the tropical climate in Southern Vietnam. This villa in Binh Nhung province, north of Ho Chi Minh City, which was probably constructed in the late 1940s, shows that influence with wide roof and floor overhangs and larger window openings to take advantage of the tropical climate. But these influences came from a distance. Unlike Japan, Cambodia, China, and other Asian countries, there were no foreign architects other than Arthur Cruz designing modernist work in Vietnam through the mid-century. Meanwhile, Frank Lloyd Wright designed two buildings in Japan, and Le Corbusier designed a large museum there. So the Vietnamese architects developed Vietnamese modernism on their own. There was also a huge construction program by the Americans during the war years with billions of dollars of infrastructure construction, including airports, seaports, military bases, highways, and bridges. But there were very few large buildings constructed by the Americans. So there was no conceivable influence on Vietnamese modernism other than what they saw in magazines. One of the few buildings constructed by the Americans in Saigon was the new American embassy in 1967, which featured a minimalist design using Brie Soleil screens in a pattern already used for a decade by Vietnamese architects. But the American military fostered development of a market for building space that allowed Vietnamese modernist architecture to flourish. The Americans leased over 150 apartment buildings and hotels in Saigon because they needed lots of office and residential space in a hurry. The Vietnamese developers and architects responded with modernist buildings. The Catnap building on what is now Dom Khoi Street was constructed in 1927 and was the first large building constructed in that early modernist style of Art Deco. French architects continued to design Art Deco apartment buildings. 
But the Vietnamese architects jumped over them and designed primarily modernist buildings. But there were no registered Vietnamese architects in colonial Indochina until the late 1930s. Therefore, the first modernist buildings in Vietnam were designed by French architects. This school was designed by Leo Krast as a school for Vietnamese children in 1931 and was the first modernist building in the colonies. It is now a high school. Adhering to the principles of modernism, there is a clear expression of structure, large openings, and an absence of ornamentation. The pattern that you see in the guardrails of the exterior corridors is an abstract modernist pattern of raised bumps. The modernist addition on the right was constructed in the 1960s. The last of the French Beaux-Arts buildings were the three buildings constructed for the rich businessman Huy Bon Hoa and his family. These buildings are now used as the Fine Arts Museum in District 1 of Ho Chi Minh City and were completed in 1934. But note that this particular building, originally constructed as an exhibition hall, has modern bones. The structural frame is clearly expressed and allowed these large openings. The roof trellis is clearly modernist. Minimal ornamentation was applied to give it Beaux-Arts style. So this was an exciting time for architecture. Classical, Art Deco, and modernist buildings were being designed at the same time. But by 1950, modernist buildings predominated in Southern Vietnam. I extend my apologies to the photographer, Alexander Gorel, for modifying his beautiful photo of the National Treasury Building, constructed in downtown Saigon in 1925. This photograph originally had a nice warm morning sunlit tone on the building with the modern high rise buildings dark in the background, where probably where they belong. But I lightened up the photo to make a point here. The Bitexco Financial Tower, the rounded tower in the background was designed by American architect Carlos Zapata and occupied in 2010. It is an international style building which is a substyle of modernism, featuring smooth glass and metal curtain wall skins. They are the bland functionalist towers seen all around the world that have tainted the reputation of modernism. However, I think architect Zapata's design is beautiful and stands out amongst the global modernist buildings. The building in the middle, in addition to the National Treasury Building, constructed in 2007, was designed by Vietnamese architects, Nguyen Chung Lu and Ngo Deng Van. Although it too uses a glass and metal curtain wall, the enclosure has a lot of added texture with the vertical fins and the insets in the form. This building follows the principles of Vietnamese modernist architecture developed in the mid century. So what distinguishes Vietnamese modernist architecture from global modernist architecture? What are the principles of this architecture? I'm going to go through six techniques the Vietnamese architects developed and used for larger buildings. And then I will follow with examples of residential projects which don't easily fit within the classification of these techniques. We start here with Brie Soleil or sunblocking elements that also excel in providing natural ventilation within a building. Brie Soleil was the French term Le Corbusier popularized for the sunblocking elements that were integral to many of his housing designs. The apartment building in the center is at 9 Lamson Square behind the Opera House in downtown Ho Chi Minh City. In the 1960s, when it was constructed, it could have been considered a bulky building, but the addition of sun shading screens over the building broke down the mass of the building, in addition to mitigating the effects of the tropical climate. These Brie Soleil provide a double skin that becomes a part of a beautiful composition 
that reflects the intensity and complexity of Vietnamese life. It is light and lacy compared to its international style neighbors on the right. The Bata Shoe Factory in District 10 is an example of a different kind of brief select using vertical fins as shown on the left-hand facade. Notice that the other facade is a different design, reflecting different environmental or functional conditions on that side. This was a common practice of the Vietnamese modernist architects. Notice also that the ends of the guardrails on the right-hand facade bend out slightly. This is a poetic touch that is not common in global modernist architecture, but is in Vietnamese modernist architecture as a reflection of Vietnamese spirit. Buildings with Brie Soleil often become very intricate designs, like this building. Originally known as the VAR building in the old banking district of Saigon, it was designed by architect Le Van Lam and occupied in 1973. Architect Lam became the foremost Vietnamese expert in intricate Brie Soleil screens, like those on this building. He was consulted on similar Brie Soleil on other major buildings in southern Vietnam. The Brie Soleil serves to break up the huge mass of this eight-story building so that it has a scale that humans can relate to, an objective of Vietnamese architecture. This installation is a testament to the knowledge and capabilities of the Vietnamese architects, engineers, and the construction industry at that time. These thin precast concrete elements have survived well for almost 50 years now with no deterioration. The University of Medicine and Pharmacy consists of multiple buildings constructed in 1966. Half of the funding for this facility was funded by the US Agency for International Development with support from the American Medical Association. The American firm of Smith, Hinchman and Grills Incorporated planned the medical and educational facilities. And the Vietnamese government selected a team of six Vietnamese architects headed by Ngo Viet Thuong to design the architecture. The perforated Brie Soleil elements were precast concrete and used repetitively, but in many different configurations. The effect of most of the facades of these buildings is laciness due to the intricate pattern of the Brie Soleil elements. This is the Hybachum Street side of the Chen Dai Mia Specialist High School. This institution was originally constructed as the Tabard School, a school for orphans in 1874. A colonial building at the corner of Hybachum and Win Yu Streets dates from 1890. This addition was designed by Huynh Kim Bang in 1960. This is double wall construction. The corridors on each floor connecting the classrooms are outside of the exterior wall, which is then protected from the sun with Brie Soleil vertical fins. This is a primary technique of Vietnamese architects to keep the sun and rain away from the exterior walls so the interior does not heat up. This technique creates an apparent outer wall, so we call this double wall construction. This is a fine example of modernist composition. While classicism uses ornamentation to cover large wall expanses in a formal composition, Modernism uses parts put together in a pleasing and harmonious composition that is abstract. The Vietnamese architects became masters of abstract composition using contrasts of light and dark, articulation of ins and outs, and a complexity of solids and voids. When building compositions either do not use the specific techniques we have been discussing here or use several of them in the same form, we consider them abstract. These abstract compositions are reviewed intellectually 
and evaluated based upon interest, proportions, movement, and wholeness. Vietnamese abstract compositions are more complex than global modernist compositions using a greater variety of elements, many of which are provided for completeness, for aesthetic enhancement in a composition rather than just for function. Some designs by Vietnamese architects are pure abstract compositions like this one. This is another addition to the Chen Dai Nia Specialist High School on Li Du Chom Street, just down from Haibachum Street. This auditorium building was designed by Huynh Kim Meng at the same time as his other building addition on Haibachum Street in 1960. This shows the versatility of the Vietnamese architects. Notice the floating roof, a practical technique for insulating the hot roof from the interior spaces below, yet is also a poetic Vietnamese touch. This thousand bed acute care hospital is located in the Tân Binh district of Ho Chi Minh City out towards the airport. Designed by Vietnamese architect Chân Dinh Nguyen, it was occupied in 1972. Architect Nguyen studied hospital design in America, funded by UNICEF, and he realized that Vietnam could not afford central air conditioning in the mid-century, so his hospital designs used natural ventilation and a decentralized layout, unlike the centralized designs he studied in America. This design is more Bauhaus inspired or industrial than most other Vietnamese modernist designs, yet each of those openings on the abstract facade uses this lattice screen of precast concrete to allow ventilation through to the halls beyond. Modernist architecture intends to express its structure while classical architecture emphasizes the wall. It was the invention of the structural frame that allowed the freedom of modernist design. One means of providing a harmonious composition of parts is to use the express structure of the building to compose a design that is essentially cellular in appearance. It uses the structural grid or grid of openings and enhances them with other elements to emphasize the cellular nature of the design. This cellular design by Vietnamese architect Nguyen Van Hoa in the early 1960s was for the Saigon Pharmaceutical Laboratories. It was demolished three years ago while photographer Alexander Gorel was recording it. This design uses the original cellular Brie Soleil configuration pioneered by Le Corbusier in France, except that this application here is much thinner and lighter which is typical of Vietnamese modernist architecture. The defining characteristic of Vietnamese modernist architecture of the mid 20th century is its lightness and complexity. As we have seen, this complexity is most often realized in a rational but rich composition of elements, such as Brie Soleil, or layering as in double wall construction. But a subset of Vietnamese architects pioneered more expressive forms and details. These were not the total forms of the European expressionism of the early 20th century, but rather used expressionist elements as part of a composition that was expressive, but nevertheless still within the restrained Vietnamese parameters of a harmonious composition. While some of these elements are sculptural, they are not representational and remain abstract. These compositions did not communicate meaning, but remained an intellectual abstraction of space, geometry, and light. These expressive projects did represent an exuberance that reflected the newly independent Vietnam, using the freedom that modernism allowed to move far beyond the bounds of classical architecture. This expressive composition was ex constructed in the 1960s in the Dachau neighborhood of District 1. That area had many embassies in the war years, so this building might have been one. 
In 1975, it was taken over by the Communist Party Central Committee for District 1. Unfortunately, they didn't see the value of keeping this building, but tore it down a couple of years ago to build a new bland, high-rise government-style building. This is another amazing expressive composition that is now used as a social services center for one of the ward governments in the Tan Binh district. As in all of the Vietnamese modernist buildings I have been showing here, people were willing to pay for all of the extra elements that make up this beautiful architecture since they understood and wanted the complex identity of Vietnamese modernist architecture. Turning now to residential architecture, the Vietnamese shop house makes economical use of urban land by being very narrow in relation to its parcel depth. The average is between three to five meters in width along the street or lane frontage. The shop houses are surrounded on the side and rear facades by other shop houses. So the design opportunity is limited to the front facade or perhaps the rooftop. With only the front facade available for design expression and identity, the Vietnamese architects introduced many innovations and architectonic elements such as these bristling trellis elements and variations in the stature of vertical and horizontal brise elements. They were looking for Vietnamese identity as well as the personal identity of the shop house owner. A street or lane will have a majority of modernist shop houses, and each will be different. This is the freedom of modernism. These designs all fit within the style of Vietnamese modernist architecture, while allowing an incredible variation in harmonious designs. As the Vietnamese architects extended these experiments in identity to the larger public and commercial buildings, Vietnamese modernist architecture became much richer than international modernism. The design of this shop house in the Phun Nguyen district cannot be found anymore since it has been covered up by a bland glass and metal facade for a dentist office. But this design shows the intricacy and expressive elements that cannot be found in architecture anywhere else in the world. This shows that Vietnamese modernist architecture is uniquely Vietnamese. This shop house in Cholun, District 5, is an excellent example of modernist architecture being an assembly of parts in a harmonious composition. But it especially illustrates a difference between global modernism and Vietnamese modernism. Ornamentation and applied decoration are not used in modernist architecture. Vietnamese architects used elements such as planters and bars as abstract elements that contribute to the overall composition. They usually have no function other than as design elements. As a result, Vietnamese modernist architecture is more, much more complex than the more minimalist global modernist architecture is more human scale and provides a spirit that is normally missing in modernist architecture. Vietnamese architect Ngo Vi Tu, who designed the Independence Palace, went to architecture school at Ecole Nationale Superior de Beaux-Arts in Paris and graduated in 1955. He was awarded the Grand Prix de Rome for architecture by the French government that year. He is the only Asian architect to be awarded this prestigious prize. He also became the first Asian architect to be awarded an honorary fellowship by the American Institute of Architects in 1962. And this was before he had designed the Independence Palace. As one of his first projects on his return to Vietnam in 1959, Architect Tu designed this masterpiece of a villa in the Bintan district of Saigon for the vice president of the Republic of Vietnam. This villa design allows more freedom to experiment than the larger public or commercial buildings. 
Many elements that were developed by Vietnamese architects for villa compositions were then used judiciously in the larger buildings. You will see many expressive elements in villas, such as the rain hoods over the windows here, that made their way into the public and commercial buildings in a more restrained manner. Vietnamese architect Do Cong Ban was the most expressive architect in the mid-century with villas like this one in District 3. The late 1960s saw the construction of many public housing complexes in Saigon to provide replacement housing for those whose homes were destroyed in warfare. The Tet Offensive by the National Liberation Front and the Northern Army in late January 1968 and the May Offensive in that same year destroyed large portions of neighborhoods in the city, especially in the Chinese area of Jilin. The Southern government, with the financial assistance of many Western donor nations, constructed within a year and a half, massive replacement housing projects that still stand well used today. In the left-hand photo, this apartment house that was in District 1 was a good example comprising several blocks. It was demolished a few years ago because it occupied very desirable land close to downtown. This modernist architecture was simple but beautiful in its restrained way, but it has a couple of lessons that we seem to have forgotten in the condo towers being constructed today. The exterior corridors keep the interiors from heating up from the daytime sun while providing opportunities for natural ventilation in the protected exterior wall. This is double wall construction. These exterior corridors, along with the large stairwells, provide plenty of socializing space, especially in the cooler evening hours. As shown in the photo on the right, the ventilation blocks provide a spectacular pattern of light on the walls of the stairs. This apartment building is still in good condition in Chalan, District 5. An excellent summary of Vietnamese modernist architecture is displayed in this building design. This is the Health Information and Education Center in District 1. This is a good example of the values and beauty of Vietnamese modernist architecture. It shows that Vietnamese modernism is a more vibrant version of global modernism and provides the Vietnamese solution for the quest for identity and spirit that is missing in global modernism. Vietnamese modernist architecture is scaled better to human senses through the decorative elements that also function as ventilation blocks in this design. The double wall construction at the end makes the composition lively with a high degree of articulation and complexity while remaining restrained overall. It is a clean, thoughtful, abstract composition of elements expressing Vietnamese identity while adhering to the original principles of modernist architecture. So why did the Southern Vietnamese embrace modernism like they did? From the ancient times of contact, with world traders along their long seacoast, the Southern Vietnamese people have been very open to new ideas and they adapt them to fit their needs and the Vietnamese culture. This characteristic continues to serve the Vietnamese people well today. So they have become citizens of the world even as they maintain a distinctly Vietnamese identity. Vietnamese modernist architecture is the primary manifestation of that identity. This eclecticism in a good way is a prime reason why the Southern Vietnamese people embraced modernism as they did. Their geography and history of resilience gave them unique circumstances upon which to develop this architecture and make it support the way they wanted to live. The Southern Vietnamese did not become beholden to iconic religious architecture as in Cambodia and Thailand. 
Rather, the Vietnamese focus on family and life, and they want their houses to reflect their personal identity as well as Vietnamese identity. This architecture resulted from the wishes of the people themselves. They expressed their desires for this kind of design, and they proved in these houses that they make good design decisions. Vietnamese modernist architecture was an expression of their independence from colonialism, representing their freedom. Vietnamese used their independence from colonialism to meet the industrial age head on, even in the face of civil war. And modernism expresses the industrial age. They are not beholden to the past and so could become modern in their thinking and accomplishments. And most of all, Vietnamese modernist architecture expresses Vietnamese identity as Vietnamese traditional architecture did in the past. And it expresses their aspirations and their place in the world in the industrial age. However, we are in exciting times once again, similar to those exciting times exactly 100 years before with the transition from classical to modernist architecture. We are now in the information age. We have seen the architecture of the information age in large buildings designed by star architects like Frank Geary and Zaha Hadid around the world. We have not seen it for houses and small buildings like schools around the world yet, but we are starting to see it here in Vietnam. I think Vietnamese architects are among the leaders in the world in developing the architecture of the information age for small buildings. And that is the topic of my current research and next book. Thank you all for attending this presentation. And I hope to see you here again someday for a presentation on Vietnamese information age architecture. <laughs>